Welcome to the AAAI podcast. I'm Bridget McCormick, the CEO and president of the American Arbitration Association. And I'm Zach Abramowitz, founder of Killer Whale Strategies and investor in disruptive legal startups. The AAAI podcast tells the story of the American Arbitration Association's AI journey. We discuss emerging trends in artificial intelligence with movers and shakers inside AAA, as well as with key influencers in the broader legal AI ecosystem. Good morning. Welcome to this recording of the Triple AI podcast. I'm your co host, Zach Abramowitz. I'm the founder of Killer Whale Strategies and an investor in legal startups. I have with me my co host, Bridget McCormick. Bridget, why don't you introduce yourself? All right, why not? Um, I'm thrilled to be here with you, Zach. I'm Bridget McCormick. I'm the CEO and president of the American Arbitration Association, um, which I've been doing for about a year. Um, and I'm really excited to be hosting this podcast with you, Zach. You've been a uh, somebody I've been following for a long time, and it's great to finally be working with you. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about the collaboration. We also have with us here um, our guest today, also from AAA, from American Arbitration Association, Diana Didia. She is the Chief Information and Innovation Officer. My first question, Diana, is... Does that make you the CIO, the CINDIO, the CIIO? How are, what, what, what's, what's the official title? I think it's, we're going with CIIO, but I, I kind of drop one of the I's a lot. So CIO is fine. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about um, your background. How, how did you get to be the um, CIO of the American Arbitration Association? What was your background that brought you kind of to that point? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I studied engineering in school, and I graduated at a really interesting time uh, in the early 90s. It was uh, when all of industry was moving off of mainframe to client server. Um, so I had a great time just riding that wave, if you will. Um, and from there, you know, that introduced me to a lot of different industries a con you know, as a consultant. Um, and I, I sort of made my way into being what I think was called a, a transformational CIO. So I was often hired to sort of fix IT departments that weren't uh, really running on all cylinders, if you will. Um, and prior to coming to the AAA, I worked for the American Institute of CPAs, and I got to the point where I had kind of put a bow on that, uh, their technology function. And, um, and through, I don't know, twist of fate or good luck, I was, uh, you know, found out about uh, the AAA hiring their first CIO. And it was a similar story. Like they had a lot of uh, motivation and they wanted to uh, really take their uh, technology department to the next level, but they were sort of digging out of a hole at the time. They hadn't properly invested, really, um, and so I was brought in to really sort of turn that function around, and then I stayed <laughs> because it's been a really um, interesting uh, place to work, and I certainly haven't run out of things to do. When you were hired, were you originally hired as the chief information officer or the chief innovation officer, and how did that evolve? Yeah, sure. I was originally hired as the CIO, first CIO for the AAA, um, and early on it was a lot about just the basics, like I like I alluded to, like really just fixing you know bread and butter, disaster recovery, and um, re honestly making sure that email like stayed up every day, <laughs> things like that. Um, and then um, it really became about cybersecurity. That was really the next chapter that took up a lot of my time and energy. Um, and then innovation, it was just a natural marrying uh, the pre in our CEO, the predecessor to Bridget, uh, India Johnson, gave me that extra eye. And it really was about, okay, now we, we have all the basics in place and we, uh, we certainly have deep expertise and, and, and really leveraging that involves marrying it to technology. And so, um, and actually one of my uh, direct reports, Linda B.A., our vice president of innovation, had really seeded an innovation program uh, at the AAA. And uh, adding that extra my, eye to my name gave her a executive suite champion to really take that program to the next level. Can I yeah, get please. in here? Um, so, really interesting background. You didn't mention where you went to school. University of Michigan. Go blue. <laughs> Just got to get that in there. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you and Linda built the innovation program and like where it started and where it is now? Sure. Um, so again, a lot of credit to Linda because this goes back about 10 years, but there was really um, a grassroots movement, so not necessarily driven from the top. It was really kind of started from the bottom uh, where there was um, 
a desire to learn about innovation practices and there was the creation of innovation teams out in the field and individuals that were going to courses and adopting some ideation strategies and visiting other companies' innovation labs and things like that. Um, and it actually had evolved to the point that at least for some software solutions that we built, we were running design sprints Again, mostly outside of IT, like that was happening in the field, and then they would bring us an idea that had already gotten to the point of you know being designed, and we were the order takers at that point, and then and then building what they uh, they had asked us to build. Um, it, under uh, when the I when I assumed the role as the champion at the at at the C-suite level, that's when we said, okay, we now we want to formalize these practices, and where we had. Um, really interesting activities happening in some different uh, regions of our company, uh, we really wanted to uh, roll that out in a consistent way, in a rigorous way across the whole organization. And so, so innovation in pockets to like a centralized innovation system. That is correct. And then we, we had just started that um, as, uh, as Bridget was being onboarded, like just before she came, we moved Linda into a full-time position as vice president of innovation. We were picking new tools to manage our pipeline of ideas. And then we were, gratefully, when we met Bridget, I, this was just great news to her because she was uh, really drives uh, uh, innovation thinking and that's really important to her. So she just helped us really just ramp it up. And you know, she's been messaging about innovation every week to all of our staff. We put all of our staff through three hours of training each on ideation. Um, and then we've rolled out a new platform for uh, submitting ideas and crowdsourcing, like they can actually comment and vote ideas up and down. And we have a whole process behind the scenes that that's the ideas in a really close collaboration between innovation and the IT department too. So when we get to the point where we have an idea that's been fully baked and has merit and it's designed and what have you, that we really can, can deliver on it quickly. And Bridget, when you came in, one of the first things that, that you did was create a mission statement that yeah. talked quite specific. Can you, can you tell, talk about that? Because I feel like that's part of the ramp up started from, from that mission statement. Yeah, and I should say, I didn't create it. I actually We actually um, crowdsourced it um, throughout the entire organization. We started with the senior team. Not only the mission statement, but the vision statement and the values statements were, um, like any organization that's been around a long time, the AAA's been around 97 years, those statements can become Franken versions of themselves because you add something on, you know, you add things on and append it and append it. And then by the time I got there and I read them, I was like, well, I'm not sure this is even grammatically correct, much less really reflects what's going on here. Because I found this unbelievable innovation program, which frankly, I didn't know about even when I accepted the job. I mean, it was just a pleasant surprise. Um, and so it seemed to me that we wanted to better reflect what's really going on. And so started with the senior team, then we um, put it through the, the, right line, uh, the, the pipeline to get a staff input. And innovation is reflected now in all of those statements. It's part of our mission statement, it's, it's, a, it's a value, um, and I, I, I think it's a better fit. Like it, it feels like the right mission statement for us. And I don't think we were, we were noticing anymore the old mission statement, so it was time to uh, revisit it. Um, so background, for if you hear any of the background noise, we're here at Legal Week one of the preeminent um, gatherings of legal professionals, you know, all from around the world. I think they say 10,000 attendees, so it's a crazy number. Um, but you all had a panel yesterday, and on that panel, I don't remember if it was you or Linda, were talking about the implementation of the software tool that you use for intake for ideas from the staff. And I think she mentioned something like there's been a 5X increase and the number of ideas that are submitted, and that that pace has sort of kept up. Yes. Um, can, can you talk about that tool? Because the, you know, when when you describe the innovation system that you arrived at, right? And, and when you came to AAA, you kind of discovered, wow, there is this robust innovation program. I had never heard about this idea, and immediately wanted to recommend it to other of my clients because it sounds so patently obvious. But can you, can you tell us a little bit how that works? Yeah, yeah. So um, we actually use a, a SaaS tool called Bright Idea, um, and they specialize in innovation pipeline management is what they do. Um, and so you can uh, customize it. So the portal has is all branded and you know uh, aligns with our brand and, and facilitates uh, interaction with our staff. But I, what we really liked about it is um, when staff submit their ideas, it has that crowdsourcing component. So staff can comment on each other's ideas and then they can vote the ideas too. And that's not the only criteria that we use to 
carry an idea forward, but it certainly lets the best ideas get our attention, right, by doing that. And I think that component where they can dialogue and, and where we're messaging alongside of it about, we've called it an innovation always culture, is what we're trying to drive. Right. Um, and since we're messaging that, you know, they're, they're busy, they're doing their day job, but this gives them a way to feel like they're part of that journey, even if they're just coming in and commenting and adding to the ideas. Um, and if they have time where they, you know, if they're either tapped or they have time to participate um, in a, uh, a larger way, they will. But at minimum, they're going in there on their breaks or what have you and commenting I and ideas and giving their, sharing their opinions. And I think that's really um, taken off, like it's resonated with them. Uh, and it kind of removes innovation from being in this like back room of oh, the absolutely. company to yeah. being something that's company wide. Yep. Yeah, and that was exactly the point. That's why I mean, we, we literally put the entire staff through a half day of innovation training. I mean, I did it at our Midtown office with like 50 other people. I was super competitive when we had like a couple of like, <laughs> co contests and um, it was great. But you're right, that's what the tool does. And it's I, I think the tool is fantastic for that reason. You, I, you know, we believe that really good ideas can come from anywhere in the company. And so we want to make sure that uh, those good ideas um, we get, we get to see them, and it, 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 it's working. It's great. And what's interesting is we're, we're already about 20 minutes into this conversation, and I feel like we haven't even touched on the words AI. Oh. Right? So <laughs> here you, you, you come in to, to AAA a little over a year ago. We talk about changing the mission statement to reflect the current values and, and to really put a stamp on we're going we're going to you know march forward with innovation and we haven't even had the launch of chat gpt yet so at, at what point did you then identify what point did you identify that like wow a lot of our innovation efforts are going to be focused on ai yeah so I accepted the job in September of 22, but I didn't start the job until February of 23. So February of 23, I was already, you know, two months into my personal ChatGPT journey um, and using it regularly in, in my own life. So when I showed up, I think the first week, were, were, I you, said, were you between positions at that point? No, I was still on. I was still the chief justice of the Michigan. Still Supreme on the Court. bench. I was on the Michigan Supreme Court trying to tell the folks at the Michigan Supreme Court they had to focus on this because it was really going to help us with our self-represented litigant problem. Um, and they were like, here she is with another crazy idea. I'm like, okay, good, I'm going somewhere else where people are all gonna be like working with me on the same page. And I, and luckily I showed up and found Diana and Linda and I was like, hey, I think we have a big thing we're gonna be doing in the next few months. And um, you know, Diana can tell the story from there. But I was, I was, I was personally like fully invested the, the first day. The first day that you arrived. Yeah. So do you remember where you were, Diana, when you first learned about ChatGPT? I don't. I feel like it's like, now it's one of those things where I feel like it's just been in our lives forever. I don't know. I do remember using it personally first, you know, for things, whether it, you know, whatever it was, you know, coming up with ideas for something, a party or what have you. Um, but I don't, I really don't remember. It just really feels like it's such a major transformational thing that I can't remember the before times of chat, before chat GPT. You know, I think it's interesting. If I was trying to remember the first time that I used Google, and I, I couldn't remember it. And I think that that's probably a very good sign of a disruptive technology, yes. right? Yeah. Where it's so um, so impactful that you kind of can't imagine life without it. And I think for those of us, there seems to be like a disconnect in, in society right now. Those who are using the tool and saying, this is the greatest thing I've ever done with a computer <laughs> versus those who are not, where it's like, oh yeah, that sounds like more AI hype. Yeah. It's a funny. It's it, it's funny that the, the distribution is as broad as it is. I mean, you find some people who um, I can't get enough because they found use cases that I haven't thought of yet. Um, in fact, one of our innovation team members was telling me, me about a GPT she built that sounds brilliant, and I'm going to build it myself later. Um, but then others, like senior partners at law firms, deans at T14 law schools, who have never used it and still aren't sure that they need to. Um, that's not our position at the AAA. I should let Diana tell more. About it. Well, well, Diana, what, I think it's what I what I was really struck by on, on the panel yesterday, and I, I also listened to Bob Ambrosi's podcast, Law Next, that he did with the two of you. And I'm familiar with a lot of, of what's going on at AAA, and yet I listen in listening to the podcast and listening to the panel yesterday. First of all, I learned about initiatives that I didn't know about, and I was simply overwhelmed with the sheer volume, I feel like any 
of my you know, law firm clients would be thrilled to have accomplished one of the tasks that you've accomplished at the AAA over the last year, and it felt like there were a number. Um, can you talk a little bit about, like, first of all, like some of the initiatives themselves, and then I kind of want to figure out, I think Bridget wants to know also, like, how are you doing all of this? Like, how, how are you, because most people would be really content with a single project. Okay, we've dipped our toes in the water. We have a little bit of a better understanding. Tell us about some of these initiatives. Yeah, sure. Um, from an innovation perspective, I think um, with Bridget, when Bridget arrived and, and the interest was married, is we really quickly set up um, pilots and learning teams that were really uh, outside of the IS department, uh, but were formally looking at these tools. So we actually uh, had early licenses to co-counsel, and we had a team of AAA staff that were in there playing and thinking about use cases that would be applicable to ADR and to the AAA. Um, we set up a, another group of people that were interested in ChatGPT. They were meeting regularly and sharing uh, you know, thoughts and ideas via, via a, a SharePoint group. Uh, we set up a prompt library. So there was a lot of exploration, and, and then there was a time in there we got a little nervous about, you know, what the, we, you're giving staff guidance about not putting sensitive information in yeah. the uh, in the tool. And again, I think we got to give Bridget credit here because I think you could go one way or the other, like be overly cautious and maybe slow down that exploration. But I think Bridget really encouraged us to, you know, let's remind people of their duty to keep things confidential, and you know, a lot of what you best practices, are, they're the same, really. It's the same best practices, just reminding staff not to do that, but not uh, discouraging them from really being in the tools. Um, and so I think there was, again, just a lot of formality and rigor around encouraging staff to experiment and then reporting out their learnings. And, and again, that was done on top of their regular duties, but I think it was so interesting that it they were just finding the time to do that. And, I, and again, it was, that started to drive then the ideas of where we could put the, the you know, use the, the, the generative AI in our system. To then move that forward, I think it was about, I think what we did well and I spoke about in our session yesterday was to pick some use cases that were narrow and small in scope and a small niche data set and just start building those to drive technical learnings around the integration of these tools. And I think, again, it's really easy to get hung up on the, you could spend hours discussing, you know, should we really have any more conversations about a digital mediator or arbitrator? You know, it, it, there's so many, you know, potential issues around bias or ethics or regulation or what have you. And that could be all of our time and energy, especially at a senior level. And discussing it. Yeah, discussing it. Yep. And I think we've said, well, those are important questions. I know Bridget's on a, in a lot of other forums where those are being discussed. And I... I'm out of that right now. I'm more on the pragmatic, like let's actually get our, uh, you know, dig in and, and cut our teeth on what how these tools work and try to stay, you know, I think we've done a good job of trying to stay right up to where, meeting them at it, where, as they're evolving and solving problems. And in order for us to really meet the moment, I just want to follow that wave. Like I want our, our team's uh, capabilities to be right up to what, what the tools are, you know, are capable of doing at the moment. So, before I, 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 want, I want to dig into something you said, but you mentioned the digital arbitrator or the AI arbitrator. Um, Bridget, I know this is like a, a big vision of yours. And, and I know we, I'm not going to ask you about like details, but in the broadest sense, why are you passionate about this concept of the, of the AI or digital arbitrator? Yeah, so I, I, I view this um, new technology as a potential, like, enormous breakthrough for what is a massive market failure in the civil justice system. 92% of Americans can't get any help with their legal problems. That includes all small and medium businesses. Small and medium businesses um, are, for the most part, legally naked. Um, it's, a, it's a huge impediment sometimes to their um, success um, overall. And the possibility that we could build both um, ways to democratize legal information, but also ways to resolve disputes that kind of are very fast, uh, trustworthy, um, and cheap, um, could make a tremendous difference to all the people right now who have nowhere to go with their disputes and basically just give up when they have a legal dispute. So I think there's like a, a tremendous like new use case for 
um, for ADR um, when when married with this technology. Obviously, that's like a ways off and well, not but something. So, you know, so this is really interesting. My, my brain tends to like be very visual. Um, and the image that I think of when I think of the AAA and I think about what Diana is doing and I think about your vision, it occurs, to, like the, the visual that I have in my mind is someone who is at the peak, or it's not the peak, someone who is at the very bottom of a mountain and about to climb that huge mountain. And along the mountain to get to this digital arbitrator, up at the top, at the summit, there are these various steps in between. And each step, to me, feels like one of the projects that Diana's working on. So whether it's something as, you know, you talked about this in the panel yesterday, taking Zoom meetings and turning those into scheduling orders, or just getting staff using ChatGPT, figuring out use cases, each one of these, rather than, like you said, focus all the discussion on, well, what will be this, what will this digital arbitrator, it's like, no, we're gonna find that out but we're gonna find that out by, t by doing some like more basic blocking and tackling on, on the way to the summit. Yep, that's a, great, that's a great way to visualize it. I think that's exactly right. And I, I don't, I think that, I guess in some of the other sessions I've sat in, I don't know that people are, are you know, I saw a lot, a lot of heads nodding when I said people are stuck on square one. And I, I think that um, I was, again, if they can keep the use cases as narrow and small as possible, then maybe you get past some senior leadership's concerns about, well, you know, you, these tools are not accurate. You know, well, if you're creating a scheduling order and a human can review it, then it doesn't matter if, it, if it's, you know, if it's 80% accurate, that's already a huge head start on creating that scheduling order. Right. So you're looking for those types of use cases just to get off of square one. So you're starting to climb the mountain. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's ironic because it, it feels like people have their, their problem with AI is that AI is sometimes too human. It's like, well, we should have a, we can't we can't have the computer do this. We need a human to do this because the computer is acting a little bit too much like our humans. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> and I think that's sort of like the, the the challenge the challenge with AI. I I think the other thing that you said um, because Bridget, you use ChatGPT and some of these other tools like regularly. I use them every day. I, I honestly don't. I, I actually I think one of the one of the ways we know it's a breakthrough technology is my own personal habits have changed. I don't use Google the way I used to use Google. I now use Claude, GPT-4, and sometimes Perplexity, depending on what my, yeah. my research interests are. Um, but I, I, my, my habits have changed in 14 months, like, dramatically. And, and, what I, and what I, where I think this, this really feeds into what Diana was talking about beforehand is one of the first steps, and I noticed this on the panel, one of the first steps you took was getting some subscriptions for your staff. It is shocking to me the number of companies that don't take that first step and they go to this other place where it's, they want to figure out like what organizational use cases can we point the AI at when the easiest thing to do is just buy a couple of subscriptions and people will then begin to figure yeah. out, oh wait, since I was able to do this, <laughs> we might be able to do this or that in, in another place. And it feels like that was just one of the biggest successes. It doesn't, it doesn't sound you know, like all that, you know, sophisticated a recommendation, buy some subscriptions, but <laughs> yes. really that, that's what, what got me to understand the use was my partner essentially forcing me to start using it. Because he said, listen, he says, you're, you're missing out. You don't get how big this is. And a week later, uh, my habits have changed as well. So, all right, so let me, so I wanna, I wanna to, to sort of like reground ourselves um, towards, towards the finale here, um, but, with all of this, right, you, you've got a robust program already. It, it feels like you'll have made such strides over the last year in the various initiatives. What's next? Well, I think uh, I mentioned again in the session that we have a lot of work going on readying our data. So that is a precursor to some of the bigger, you know, that before we can really get to the summit, we're going to have to do a lot of work with our data. Um, and that requires building some capacity around that, whether it's resources or technology or what have you. And, and again, that we've been um, approved to, <laughs> we've been approved to invest there as appropriate. Um, and then I think we just want to start expediting on this backlog of ideas that we have. And I think some of the challenges are going to be, um, 
you know, whether we retrofit some of this into our like existing case management system, or we decide it, this is all, we want to put it so many places, we should just start over. Um, and that is just, will be a lot of development hours to do that, but that might be the best way to really leverage these technologies to the fullest. So I think there's just going to be a lot of questions about uh, prioritization. You know, we're not a really large company, so there isn't unlimited resources. Um, and I think it'll come down to, um, yeah, where, how much do we want to put into maybe uh, making our current systems more efficient versus building brand new products like a predictive or prescriptive or early case evaluation tool that might benefit, um, you know, we would put at the beginning of our case administration process and maybe put off, you know, significant integration into our case management system until later. I don't know, I think those are going to be some of the challenges and what we need to discuss as to what really helps us to meet our strategic objectives the best. Parting thoughts, Bridget? Um, we have so many ideas, and um, I think your analogy was a great one. I feel like we've actually taken some pretty big steps up the mountain, um, and it is exactly the way we're thinking about it. We think that these smaller projects are helping us learn so that when we're ready, our data's ready, and our uh, competencies in-house are ready, we'll be able to take those bigger bets. Um, but I, 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 I couldn't have more confidence in this team. I, I, hope you're, I, hope the, I hope the listeners got a sense of how talented Diana Didia is, but she and her team are unbelievable and I feel very lucky that um, I landed in a place where uh, I lucked into such a talented group of people. Diana, thanks for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. It was really fun. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of the Triple AI podcast. Please consider leaving us a rating and review on your favorite podcasting platform. And don't forget to follow and subscribe so that you never miss an episode.